We woke up this morning with a punch in the gut. The Americans decided not to use their power of veto and abstained on the vote. Just makes our enemies, Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran, smack their lips with glee because it's like an invitation to further attack us. Respectfully and disrespectfully, I don't care that it's Ramadan and you want to see fired. Just like they didn't care it was Sifat Torah for us. There is an ongoing attempt to vilify Israel, but more broader, the entire Jewish community in the what we call the human rights space. Welcome back, everyone, to our new episode of The Quad. Here in our lovely new studios, to my left, Vivian Berkovich, former ambassador of Canada to Israel, which is going to be very relevant to our conversation today, also founder of her own State of Tel Aviv podcast. And to my right, Ashira Solomon, political commentator and moderator. And Emily Schrader, who is not with us today because she's on a very important mission in London, but we'll be hearing a little bit more about what she's doing over there soon. So ladies, we woke up this morning with a punch in the gut that the UN vote last night, which was about the ceasefire for Israel um, and the, the release of the hostages, but not linked together, which I think is an important thing to say, because if it was linked, perhaps we would have been so bothered at the fact that the Americans decided not to use their power of veto and abstained on the vote. To Israel, that's a diplomatic punch in the gut. The last time that it was used was by Obama. Um, and we still haven't forgot. We still have the scars from that. So we can start with you as a, as a former ambassador. How bad is this? So, I mean, it's, it's not good. Um, I woke up and uh, how bad is it? It's bad. I mean, what it does is it demonstrates, I think, more than anything, because we know that these, these resolutions are non-binding. Okay, right? so that's, what the, that's the good news. Yeah. They can say what they want. Yeah, but it's the U.S., and we know that there are extreme tensions between the U.S. and Israel in terms of every aspect of the relationship at the moment. And for the U.S. to come out and say, we're not really supporting you, and to do that publicly just makes our enemies, Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran, smack their lips with glee. Because it's like an invitation to further attack us, because... U.S. isn't happy with them. Exactly. They're bringing their fights out into the public. So it's a very important symbolic moment. And do you think it's a coincidence that this morning we got news that Hamas rejected the deal? I, I don't think it's a coincidence. So that I don't think, I don't, I have zero optimism, and I'm sorry to say this, about any deal with Hamas with respect to hostages. Zero. But we had one. We had one. That was we got 100 people out. That was in November. We're now months later, and the people who remain in captivity are have a very different profile. And a lot of water has, is under the bridge since then. Uh, and I'm not alone in that very, very and sad, depressing. Very. So I actually don't think they're at all related. I don't think that there is going to be a deal with Hamas, and they certainly weren't going to accept this one, not at this time. Um, I think that what's more pointed and important is the fact that, you know, Israel... And Yahoo was sending over several important delegations, and in particular, one led by Ron Dermer, who's the Minister of Strategic Affairs. Yes. Um, and they were, and the National Security Advisor, and they were going over there to discuss um, Rafa. Exactly. Which they have turned into. They've turned it into this. What the hill, hill to die on? The, the hill, hill to, to die, die on. on. And but don't they understand that that's where the four last battalions of Hamas are left? They want us to. They they, they want us to get rid of Hamas, and yet that's where they are, and that's where Sinwar is. Wow. Ashira is an American. Oh, I was just going to, okay, yeah. Oh, just, <laughs> wait, let, let me go to the American. This is your country too. <laughs> yes. That's your country. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that America this time did not have our back? Um, I'm very disappointed in our country. Um, we are allies. We need, America needs Israel. Furthermore, I am tired of hearing about a ceasefire we talk about the humanitarian issue that's happening in Gaza. Them holding our hostages is also a humanitarian issue. And it should be, that should be at the forefront of our conversation that our hostages need to be released. Ceasefire 
we shouldn't even be talking about a ceasefire until we can talk about the day after, talk about our relationship with, you know, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. So I don't respectfully and disrespectfully, I don't care that it's Ramadan and you want to ceasefire. Just like they didn't care it was Sifat Torah for us. Just like they don't care that all of our hostages are meeting, missing Shabbat every day. Just like they don't care that Pesach is coming up for us and we don't have our hostages. Or that it was Purim yesterday. Or that it was Purim yesterday. Huh. So um, I don't want to hear any more conversation around ceasefire. All I want to hear is that we need to bring our hostages home. So where is this all going? Um, like you said, Vivian, it's non-binding. What can be, what, what's the fallout of this? Okay, like you said, Hamas is smacking their li the lips in joy. In fact, they, they declared that they welcomed the decision. Um, I, thought, I thought it was very interesting. I heard Miri Eisen at APAC and she said, she said, she said Hamas has a defense strategy, A, using the hostages, B, using their own population. And see, using the world. This is, this is it. And they're really good at it. Let's they're really good at it. But Sinwar, and, and we're not. I mean, I have to say, I think that over the course of this war, we've not been fabulous at managing our, our you know, military issues, but also our, our I don't want to say Hasbara, but our Hasbara, and yes. explaining our position. Well, we have no and strategy. We don't have a strategy. And that's very apparent, not just in terms of how we explain it to the world, but domestically. Yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. It's a mess. And you know what? Six months later, I'll be the one to say it. The levels of trust in the governing authorities, whether it be the civilian government or even the upper echelons of the IDF, are not high. Well, that's people. The understatement of the year. They trust the army because it's the people's army. It's their army. But in terms of leadership, I'd love to see the metrics because they've probably gone lower. It's a really big problem when you're failing domestically six months into a crisis like this, you got a big problem. So where does it all go? Where does it all go? I don't know. You tell us. Where does it all go? I say, no, we're good. I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm praying I that we'll, I'm praying that we'll get over this as we've gotten over other things. And ultimately, if we need to go into Rafa, and maybe the mistake was waiting and letting the whole world weigh in yeah. on this conversation yeah. on, like Ashira says, a military decision. Why are we letting the whole well, world it? weigh in on this? Is it? Is it a military? Is it? A if the last four battalions of Hamas are there, if Sinwar is there, surrounded himself by hostages, what do we do? Oh, and the other thing that really bothers me is, why is nobody putting any onus on Egypt? Yeah. It's like everybody's scared of saying the word Egypt. And I'm not... I'm not either, but it seems like in the establishment, you can't mention Egypt. Egypt is about to fall apart. Its economy is falling apart. They're being held up by America and the World Bank. If there was ever a moment to demand from Egypt to take in refugees yeah. temporarily and then bring them back after the war would be now. We demand nothing. The, the irony that Gutierrez is standing on the other side of the border in Egypt talking about how Israel won't let in uh, enough humanitarian aid when Egypt hasn't let any in. Yeah. It's just, it just, you, you, if it wasn't so tragic, it's so absurd. So I was thinking about how for us as Jews, when our people were being persecuted, let's say in uh, Ethiopia, we did two operations to go get our people. And Egypt, they won't even let their come they in the door to come over. Yeah, they, they won't even open the door. With respect to Rafa, mm. um, you know, none of us are military strategists. No, but we speak to people who know a lot more about this than we do. Um, it's it's the whole thing is really weird the way we went into the north and go now now how did how did we end up with eight thousand Hamas fighters in the south? We let them in, we let them pass through. They came from the north. Yeah, I, I agree that we okay. haven't been the sharpest I in terms of strategy. You know what? From the very beginning, Biden Biden said this, Blinken said this, and many people within the Israeli um, military sort of leadership and elite and political said this. They all said, plan for the day after. Go I'll in that. with a plan, because if you just go in and you don't know where you're going, you're going to get into a colossal mess just like we did in Iraq. We Americans. Because the punchline is, is, Ron Dermer said last week, well, how could we go in with a plan for the day after? Because if we went in with a plan for the day after, it would be dead on arrival because it's Israel. And, it, and it's like you're taking me in circles. You're, I feel like I'm going kind of cuckoo here. 
You absolutely have to have a plan for battle. You have to have a plan for how you want things to end. And we didn't. I'm not sure we didn't have a plan for battle, but maybe I think you're right about not having a plan for the day after. And I think that's probably what I had the Americans to get them to the point where they're, the way they're, you know, punching us in the gut. Do you also think that we didn't have a plan? I think that it, it's, it was hard for them to plan. I think that this is hard for Israel to plan. Yeah, like I just, we're not a planning country. No, not at all in general. But I just I think that it's been hard for them to strategize. I want to be a little bit more sympathetic and just say that every day something new is happening in their they are just reacting rather than being proactive. Yeah. And let's talk about this kind of feeling of isolation and and especially with the news, the bombshell, another bombshell, every day there's a new one, we got last week, that Canada is boycotting exports of military equipment or military hardware to Israel, which I also think is more symbolic than actually going to harm us in any way, because from what I understand, we actually <laughs> export to them more than they uh, export to us. Vivian, you are the former ambassador you have been knee deep in the Israel Canada relationship. And in the last few weeks, you have been knee deep in trying to save it. Knee deep. I'm like drowning. Next um, deep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, it's again, it's another, you know, non binding. It's a motion that went to Parliament. Um, and motions are non binding, they're meant to sort of take the temperature of the, the, the moral temperature on an issue of Parliament. And so, it was um, a motion brought by uh, the coalition government that Trudeau leads. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, I need my bell. We're, I need a we're bell. Getting, right? We're getting a bell. Yeah, we're getting a bell. bell. All right. But um, it was also uh, it really recognized the state of Palestine. That's some of the wording that was watered down, but that still kind of sits behind the motion. It also uh, called, of course, for an immediate and total ceasefire. Um, and for the immediate release, unconditional release of all hostages. But this, to me, is one of the more offensive clauses because there is no distinction between hostages and security prisoners. Yeah. So someone who was a real live terrorist who bombed and blew up people and has real blood on their hands yeah. uh, and is imprisoned in an Israeli uh, jail uh, is equated to a with... baby. Exactly. And so that's the real issue is the moral issue. And I know from speaking with people in... Israel um, and in Canada, that the main concern is the precedent. Yeah. Right. And and will this make it? Oh wow! Like you know, Canada doesn't matter until usually it does something stupid like this. And so, will Canada, a G seven country, embolden other countries to follow? And that's a real concern. Well, thank you for that synopsis. Blame Canada. Blame Canada. By the way, I love that song. No, yeah. but we have so many good friends in Canada. Yes, we do. We love Canada. And certain people in Canada really love Israel. So many. Not, those people are the ones who are ruling Canada very soon. Apparently, 70% of Canadians actually support Israel. Oh, so, oh that's amazing. Well, there you go. That's nearly as many as 80% of Americans. Shocked do. me, but yeah. there you go. So Emily Schrader, who is in London right now, is doing some valuable work against the haters, against the people who are calling for our extermination. And she had this short report from London. Hey everyone, I'm sorry I can't be with you guys today. I really miss you all, but I did want to share with you a little bit of what's going on here in London. So I am here on a series of lectures, meetings, and of course, activism, as you can see behind me. Uh, we are actually right now outside Amazon in the UK, where uh, Amazon has strangely not in any country in any office said anything about the fact that one of their employees is actually among the hostages. And so there's a large group of Israelis, of Iranians, and of other Israel supporters who gathered tonight to put up posters, you can see behind me, all the way down outside of the Amazon offices, uh, demanding a response, demanding that Amazon take action, do something, or at least say something to secure the release of their uh, employee who is in Hamas captivity, Sasha. We are praying for his release as well as the release of all the innocent hostages here behind us. So throughout this week, I've been active in 
putting up flyers along with the Iranian community. In fact, one of the things we did yesterday was we put up flyers not only of the uh, hostages who are, of course, have been kidnapped by Hamas and are in captivity still, but also of some of the Iranians who are political prisoners who are still in prison in Iran under the Islamic Republic, some of which have been kidnapped themselves from foreign countries, such as Jamshid Samad, who was kidnapped from Dubai and taken and is now actually on death row. So we are, are taking action. We are not going to go silently. And no matter how much they, uh, they tear down these posters, we are going to keep putting them back up and ensuring that people hear their stories and that people know what's going on. And we're going to continue calling for their release. And in solidarity with the Jewish community in the UK because of what you guys stand for. You don't stand for the oppressed, you stand for the oppressor. That is what yeah. is. Yeah. That is what is. So now to go into the issue of the UN, of humanitarian aid, a little bit more in depth is my good friend and vice president of NGO Monitor, Olga Deutsch. So welcome to Olga Deutsch, who is the vice president of NGO Monitor, and you have been working for years on the issues of humanitarian aid, which nonprofit organizations in the Gaza Strip, also Judea, Samaria, West Bank, are legit, which ones aren't. You've been calling them out insistently for years. Olga, make a little bit of seder, as we say, order in our heads. What is going on in Gaza Strip? What is failing? Why are we getting the blame? And who's actually distributing aid, if anyone? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Awesome show. <laughs> Since the uh, Oslo Accords in 1993, the international community, through humanitarian and other aid, has siphoned around $40 billion to the Palestinian society. Now, it's not only Gaza, right? We're talking about Gaza, uh, West Bank, and East Jerusalem. And it goes through humanitarian aid and all kinds of other uh, aid packages. Some of it goes directly to the uh, Palestinian Authority and their different uh, uh, offices and ministries, but a lot of it goes to and through organizations that portray themselves as humanitarian or human rights groups. And the October the 7th did not happen in a vacuum, right? We It happened in a reality in Gaza where no one condemned the massacre of October the 7th because for 30 years since October the, uh, since the Oslo Accords, we have seen a steadfast process of radicalizing the Palestinian society where it's okay to, to, to uh, commit October the 7th. Now, a lot of that has happened either thanks to the humanitarian aid or without the international community checking properly. No accountability. Very little. First of all, let's start that there's very little transparency around the issue, right? We all talk about UNRWA, but UNRWA is only one out of 24 UN agencies operating in the Palestinian society. Now, the same issues that we see in UNRWA, right? And there's so much uh, uh, evidence coming out in the public uh, since October the 7th. So... This whole thing is a ticking bomb. Now, there is a dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza. There's no question about it. The, anyone uh, in their right mind who sees the images is devastated, right, uh, over what's going on with the civil po population. But there's got to be a way to discuss these issues somewhere in between saying no aid at all and aid at any cost. And that's basically what's happening right now. They're saying we want to continue sending humanitarian aid at any cost. No checking because there's a humanitarian crisis. In other words, wh where is the where is the holdup? Is it the quantity? Is it the distribution? Is it that Israel is checking every aid truck? Where is the problem? Well, there are two, you know, the days after, right? There's the day after physically in Gaza, who's going to run uh, Gaza administratively? Who, who is Israel going to cooperate with? What's going to be the role of the Abraham Accord countries and so on? But there is the day after um, for the international donor community. And what is the aid? How is the aid going to be delivered? Now, there is securing the aid physically, right? Whether it's food packages or fuel or whatever it is. And there's a bunch of solutions that I'm not an expert on, of physically tracking, putting tracking devices and so on, checking what goes in, what goes out. But um, there is a whole other part of the humanitarian and other aid that is being delivered in non-physical uh, ways. Did you know 
that political advocacy is a legitimate category of humanitarian aid, meaning that a lot of the what we think is humanitarian aid, and we envision food packages and flour and you know uh, clothes or me medicine for uh, for the civilian population, actually goes to political advocacy projects. So let's connect the dots. When there is the ICJ co court case, you're right, um, against Israel by South Africa. There's at least four organizations who enjoy humanitarian aid sitting in the audience, you know, on the South African side. There is Al Haq, the biggest uh, Palestinian human rights organization, whose uh, advisor co-authored the the claim. So the entire apartheid genocide libel it's coming from these so-called human rights organizations, and like to put that are funded by the by the world oftentimes. And all under the auspices of we are providing humanitarian development, human rights aid. To put that if in an even broader context, there is an ongoing attempt to vilify Israel, but more broader, the entire Jewish community in the what we call the human rights space, right? So every place where we're supposed to talk about justice and protecting the, you know, the underprivileged and so on, we are being slowly but systematically taken out of those spaces by pushing for this agenda that Israel is an apartheid, that we there is a white supremacy here, or as uh, some organizations, even Israeli groups have called it Jewish supremacy and so on and so on. And what we have seen after October the 7th is that trend on steroids, right? Because what used to be apartheid libel now is genocide libel, ethnic cleansing libel, and so on. Um, so what happened at the UN uh, Security Council vote uh, yesterday also doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? So you have a completely morally compromised organization that is the United Nations. Everything you say, first of all, I could listen to you talk all day, but like <laughs> fast, yeah, it's just fantastic. Like fascinating, and I just, you know, I'm sitting here wanting to interrupt, but I didn't. Um, but everything you say is interesting and valid and all those great things, but we can't muddy the water because right now we're in an existential fight, in my view, for the future of our country, its safety, its security. And not only that, um, we don't want to become the South Africa of the world. We don't want to become diplomatic uh, and trade pariahs. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things that are valid and true aren't for today. What's for today is the global fixation on the lack of food and medicine. And they don't want to hear any of this other stuff. That's what we have to fight, focus on, and win. And we're not winning. There is only as much that all of us in the public, non-governmental sphere can do. And we can do a lot. And if October the 7th or the aftermath of it has proved one thing, that's definitely that. But there is also a diplomatic vacuum coming out of Israel, I think. We need yes. to do uh, much more of it and in a much more sophisticated manner yeah. to address that complexity. But all the while, just with the yeah. last sentence, we must not forget the day after, meaning that political processes, and you know best, you, you, you know this, Vivian, best, um, they take a, a while. So to work with the governments, the donor, the international community, in order to make sure that, the, that after the war, in the post-war Gaza, mm. um, the aid packages are transparent, vetted pro pro properly, if there's a sign of misconduct or, mar or abuse, that there is a sanction in place, we need to start working on these plans today with the government because these things take uh, a long time. Olga, you have a magic wand, let's say. NGO <laughs> Monitor, you've been researching, you've been advocating, you do, you particularly do a lot in Europe, uh, but your organization does a lot everywhere else. Two, three quick solutions that could happen today to solve this aid crisis in Gaza. We as a collective, we need to speak up and say this is the truth and this is the line that we as a community put aside right wing, left wing, whatever, because right now on these issues, we on are the on the same side, right? So we need to be more vocal on that. Now, the second part is um, on the side of the governments. We need to be, and this goes hand in hand, the Israeli diplomatic uh, apparatus, right? Need to be sharing more information and more proactively. So when something like in the UK with David Cameron happens, so that um, the uh, the parliament, the members of the parliament, the men members of the, the, the House of the Lords have the actual 
facts yeah. to counter that or to balance that or to say, well, hold on, you know, he said that, but we don't all think that. And I don't know that we are always doing that. And I think that at the same time, and this is a tough reality in which we live, we need to uh, continue trying to do everything in our power because this is the only thing we can uphold to, right? Which is our internal integrity and mor morality compass to, yes, provide the humanitarian aid in the best way that we can and to, our, to the best of our knowledge and ability, despite a super complex situation. No, but in terms, I think la la last thought, and then we're going to let you go back to your important <laughs> work, Olga. But I think what's very important, and this is what I'm concerned about, is that you're right, the day after has to involve better scrutiny and accountability of those so-called humanitarian aid organizations. The problem is, if they're all under the UN, which is inherently biased, corrupt organization, umbrella organization, how we're going to do that? And maybe this is really an appeal for all those good countries, all those countries that do care about both sides, don't just give money without knowing where it's going. Thank you so much, Olga Deutsch. Thank you for having me. And now for our very favorite and popular segment of Scumbags and Heroes. Let's start with the scumbags. Ashira, who is your scumbag of the week? I have a two scumbags of the week. Two, Ashira. Yeah. Greedy. <laughs> <laughs> So one is Hafida bin Shahida, and the second one is Olga Zaborati, Zaborati I think is how I say her name. Um, this week, I attended a women's politi political leader summit in Athens, Greece, hosted by the first woman president of Greece, Kolokovo to her. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a policy session on sexual violence. There were two members there from the Knesset. Every woman went around talking about sexual violence during conflict and war and how it affects their country. The Israeli members started to speak about what happened to Israeli women on October 7th. Hafida, who was a senator uh, from Algeria, stood up and said, fake news, no rapes happened on October 7th, that the New York Times debunked it, CNN debunked it, etc. So then her friend, Olga, who is the deputy uh, prime minister of Moldova, Moldova also said fake news and you and said, you know what you guys are doing to the Gazan women over there. So the Knesset members, myself, everyone stands up. This turns into a shouting match. Oh I think we have a God. clip of it. We can roll it. Um, and all the women end up leaving the session. There was one woman who said, listen, let's focus on the suffering of both Israeli women. We cannot deny that. And let's focus on the suffering of the Gazan women. She was like a bit moderate, but I was completely shocked not only was i angry but afterwards i was hurt even the knesset member ifrat uh Reitan, she started crying she started weeping they were it. literally denying it and call it coast denial Did denying not do it. it the woman came up to me she grabbed my badge because i stood it up to her face i said listen i live in israel i watched the 47 minute video we went down to kibbutz Bayeri. she said uh don't talk because you're from the united states because my badge said u.s i said no i am i'm a jewish woman and i live in israel you're not going to tell me not to speak um and so it was a complete balagad during that conference as well a lot of people made statements for Gazan women. There were no statements for Israeli women whatsoever. That's the world. You just saw a little snippet of what's going on everywhere, yeah. which to me is just another form of a new anti-Semitism. I'm just so shocked because I know we see it on TV and we see the layman, but you can front us, but we're right there. And like, these are people who are in positions of power, people who are supposed to, you know, be moving forward diplomatically. And we're there as a, at a woman summits were there to talk about all women's pain all women's suffering all the uh barriers into politics for women we're here to support women and when you couldn't put the politics aside for one day and say support all women except Israeli women. yeah you can't put it aside and just just acknowledge the fact that Israeli women were also massacred and raped on October 7th regardless of what you think about Israel well, were the scumbags indeed, and we'll put up their uh, their faces and name and shame. Vivian, I know this is your particularly favorite segment. Yes, <laughs> always. Um, I'm going to do, I'd like to share, I'm going to do a bit of a group scumbag, um, and I'm going to um, include in my group all of the political leaders of ultra-Orthodox parties in Israel. Before you throw things at your TV, hear me out. 
um, we really are in a huge crisis in this country and um, we need soldiers. Uh, we need more people in the army and the very small number of Israelis who do army service and who work and who pay taxes can no longer sustain all those burdens. And um, this has been known, we've been kind of lurching toward this moment, you know, for decades. We're here. Um, it's not just that the people who serve are angry. It's they simply cannot do it anymore. Well, I'll sustain it. And we are facing a real crisis and it could well bring the government down. And I kind of hope it does. And the crisis is that every year since the founding of the state, there is a law in the books. And it says every man reaches the age of 18 has to serve in the army. And every year we do this exemption for the ultra-Orthodox. Say, you know, okay, unless you're studying Torah full time. No, the Haredim, you Haredim who live out in the diaspora, you have to work for a living. No one supports you. And it has to be the same way here. There are, there are responsibilities and there are burdens uh, and benefits of living in a state, uh, you know, roads, bridges, and airports. And unfortunately, in this country, army service is one of them. And the ultra-Orthodox parties are united and galvanized and opposing any measure. Any compromise. Any compromise. And it's enough. Absolutely. Enough. Enough is enough. Time to The gravy step up. drain is over. My scumbag this week is a female professor of Hebrew University. I think a lot oh, of yeah. people heard the story. Nadera Shalhuv Kavokia. She is, was employed. She was doing a Zoom and basically said Zionism should be abolished. She denied also, like the people that you encountered, the October 7th rapes mm. and massacres and the killing of the babies, completely denied that anything like that happened. And she's talking about how we should be planning for the end of the Zionist enterprise. And she was temporarily dismissed from Hebrew University because it was too much. She hasn't been properly dismissed from Hebrew University. They dismissed it till the end of the semester. So we're going to have to see what happens. But what this lady doesn't understand is that the very institution that gave you that position is a Zionist institution that was created in 1925 by Albert Einstein, by Chaim Weizmann, two huge Zionists. Chaim Weizmann is a pillar of the Zionist fathers of this country. Lady, you wouldn't have a job if it weren't because of the Zionist institution that is paying your salary. So you know what? You want to have some dignity? You want to have some type of honesty with what you believe? Then leave because you're being employed by the very people you want to destroy. All right. Ooh. Let's finish with heroes. And we need something positive this week. I just feel that we kind of need that. Positive, quick, I'm hero. Like every other week. Positive, quick, hero. Betty Eisenkot, member of the war cabinet. Lost a son early in the war. Yeah. Uh, former IDF chief of staff. Now member of Knesset. And... Um, you know, in this kind of theater that we're now under, what we're now living through with the ultra orthodox saying, "No, we're not serving. This is your you got you guys do the army. We'll pray." And Gadi Eisenkot um, is kind of holding the line. And so Benny Gantz, who's also in the war cabinet in the government, Benny not Benny Gantz, sorry, Yoav Gallant, Minister of Defense, said, "I won't support any bill with respect to the draft of the ultra orthodox um, without consensus, without the support of yeah." all of the center and the center right parties. And that basically means you guys, Gadi and Benny. And they said, we're not going to support anything other than a requirement that the ultra-Orthodox uh, have to serve. I think and that so, Gadi Eisengard has been tougher than Benny Gantz. Well, he's just, you know what? Maybe he's built for it more. Yeah. I don't know. He's 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 kind of a, he's he built, built like a, yeah. you know. So that's short, sweet, and um, it sets up the drama for next week domestically. Yeah. What about you, Ashira? I have two heroes this week. Oh, okay, <laughs> two and two. Um, so my two heroes are the Knesset members who were at the WPL oh, Summit good. in Greece, Orit HaKohen and Ifrat... Orit Farkash HaKohen. Farkash HaKohen yeah. and um, Ifrat Reitin. Right, mate, yeah. Um, those two women, they stood strong when those other women denied the rapes that happened on October 7th to the Israeli women. They stood strong. They argued strongly. They did not back down. And um, I was just really proud to see them in the room and not cowering down, which is 
normal for an Israeli woman. Like, you're not going to go up against yeah. an Israeli like, woman. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and think uh, Israeli woman's going to cower down, uh, but they represented Israel very well, and they, and they use their voice very powerfully for our women. Thank you, Shira. So my hero is a big bunch of people. Um, I met them this morning as I had a very hostile interview at the beginning of the day, and then I met them and they kind of restored my faith. And I just want to talk in general about the majority of the evangelical community who are really standing strong. We've had some of our friends on the show, like Reverend Haley Ace and Xavier DeRusso, but there's so many people in the United States and around the world who are coming who are actually taking a flight and coming with a group. And this morning I met such group from Indiana and they 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 um, made this quilt saying, you are not alone, Aww. which is exactly what I needed at exactly that moment. I was like, right. Did you get the quilt? I've got the quilt. I'm going wow. to put it somewhere uh, respectable, somewhere public. Uh, but it's just, uh, you know, when you feel that people are turning your backs, it's just wonderful to feel the warmth of the people who love and support you and understand what we're going through. So on that note, we complete our show this week. Please like and subscribe. And hopefully we pray every week that by next week we will have our hostages home. Thank you. Thank you.